There is a saying, when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. We have that written here because we like that quote. So is that a you quote? Did that? Did you come up with that quote? I'm, I, didn't, yes, I, I didn't come up with it. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. I, well, no, that's an, okay. That is an epic quote. <laughs> that's an epic quote. The very facets of what makes pickleball such a, go a good sport, such a popular sport to play, uh, are as true here in America as, as they are anywhere in the world. I, I think it's going to make some people sit up and say, ah, oh, that's what they've been doing. All right, you guys know Gamma. They just came out with their new Airbender paddle. Being able to change your paddle is a game changer with the new Gamma Airbender. With a variable weighted end caps and Zorbicon Shockbuster gel inserts, you can tailor your paddle to fit your game perfectly. That's right, Zorbicon Shockbuster gel inserts. Adapt on the fly and reduce harmful vibrations for smoother play. Get your Airbender today and use code DINK10 for 10% off your purchase on GammaSports.com. That's all caps, DINK10, for 10% off your purchase at GammaSports.com. Everybody's going to want the Zorbicon Shockbuster gel inserts. So go get yours. The new Airbender paddle from Gamma. All right. I think we're we're recording. Yeah, pull your mic up, dude, please. There we go. Uh, we've got Tom Webb, APP CMO. He's out in the lobby, so we'll bring him in soon. But we've got a few uh, topics to cover, just you and me, before uh, we, we bring him in. Um, but, uh, yeah. All right. So first things first, we want people to leave us voicemails, uh, for next week. So we won't do any voicemails today, but next week we have, and the good thing about having him on is I'll finally figure out how to pronounce his name. Jaume Martinez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it feels like you're just bastardizing the name by saying Jaume. Right. But like, like he introduces himself it. as yeah. Jaume. Yeah. yeah so. Okay. All right. Um, Cool. So we'll have him on and uh, so leave voicemails for him. Uh, the other thing is if you want to review paddles, we'll give you a bunch of free paddles and you'll just review paddles for us. Uh, if that sounds interesting, email the dink team at heydink.com. Uh, and then lastly, we've got a live giveaway with Franklin right now, which is uh, you can find it at giveaway.thedinkpickleball.com slash Franklin or go to like our Instagram bio. We'll have it in the show notes. Um, and uh, first place gets an FS Tour limited edition bundle, Dynasty or Temple paddle, plus a Magic Carbon Eraser and a paddle cover. Paddle cover, very cool. Um, and nine runner-ups. So there's 10 total winners. Uh, you can choose between a Dynasty or Tempo FS Tour paddle. So that's giveaway.thedinkpickleball.com slash Franklin. And lastly, congratulations, Zane. Thanks. This wasn't on the agenda before just now, but it's kind of spoiled when I'm looking at the script, but uh, appreciate it. 20,000 YouTube subscribers. We won, believe it or not. Podcast of the year. Uh, it's crazy how we pull yeah, our own we, audience yeah, and win. I love it. It's, <laughs> it's the best. Uh, we and... won't say how much we won by after <laughs> polling our own audience, but we did win. A win's a win. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll actually, we'll go through the percentages. Okay, we will. Second. Uh, you also won Most Influential Voice. Congratulations on that. And you were third in Fan Favorite. Ooh. Behind, I think, me. Anna Bright and Tyson McGuffin. I can't um, believe I didn't get Player of the Year. Well, listen, I thought a bunch of big accomplishments. Got to get him a gift, right? Oh, boy. Is it the pickleball box? I, I want a pickleball box. The Dink Dot Shop for the pickleball box, the best pickleball subscription. But no, that's not what it is. I got you a signed hat by me. This Says is sick. To Zane, congrats, 20K subs, pot of the year, influential voice, and fan favorite, parentheses, third. So now you finally have something autographed from me. This is this is legit. This is sweet. I, li I do like it. Congrats, <laughs> 20,000 subs, pot of the year. It's dated. That's nice. Today, influential voice, fan favorite. I love it. And my signatures you put on eBay if you want. <laughs> this is Make giving this is giving when I was at that Orlando Magic game and I just went up to Joe Ingles and gave him a signed hat. <laughs> you is, did? Uh, yeah, you don't you've never seen this clip? No, uh -uh. Jamie, clip it. Yeah, there it was we were at the the Magic game cuz it was pickleball night at the Magic game and the, the Magic owners own the Orlando Squeeze and uh me and Joe Ingles are just homies. 
and we were out on the court like throwing stuff to the fans and whatnot and uh i had one extra hat obviously always have a uh, sharpie ready in case i gotta sign stuff in case i'm mobbed by the Getting crowd recognized all the time and uh, i was like you know what this six foot ten australian guy standing here on the court all sweaty looks like he wants a hat from me yeah and ryan actually told me like a week ago he still got it over in his uh over in his locker that's he's got cool. the orlando yeah. squeeze hat that's actually signed by cool. zane so you got to watch all the like post game interviews in the locker room and see if you can spot that Ooh, good call um but yeah all right so dink awards they're done the results are in so we already talked about two of them podcast of the year I mean, there's no way we don't get accused of cooking the books on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so we might, uh, we're at least publishing the percentages, but over 6,000 people voted. So you can do the math on that. But Pickle Pod had 19.5%. King of the Court, 17%. Briona's Pickleball, 11.6%. Didn't see that one coming. Good stuff. Uh, it feels He's got a right. a big audience. Yeah, he, because he does all that instructional content. He actually has built quite a YouTube channel. Yeah, I think he's got almost 100K subs on YouTube, right? Yeah. Yeah. So prime no, it's not prime time pickleball anymore. It was rebuilt it. Own. Yeah, that's a whole yeah. whole bit of drama. He's at fifty seven thousand subs. I'm actually gonna go. I'm gonna go on his his pod uh, in a couple weeks over there in Arizona. Nice. In case you guys didn't have enough of me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll say you're. I mean, you're very good relative to other pros at just keeping your name in the mix. You're all over the place. I appreciate the relative to other pros way to qualify that one. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Point being, other pros need to step up their game. Not you're not doing a good job. Anyway, uh, let's see what were so James Ignatowicz show was at eight point eight percent, which I thought was uh, a surprise. I like the pod, but I didn't know. Um, yeah, I'm not. I don't think he really does the pod anymore. Compliment. Does he? Does he do the uh, pod anymore? I don't know. I watched one the other day, and he basically just like talks at the camera. But some of it's pretty interesting. Uh, and then tennis sucks was eight point two percent. I would have put tennis sucks higher. Yeah, I, I thought it would have been higher. Uh, Pickleball studio, not even, not even out there. Yeah, they're just a um, rounding error. Damn. Yeah, what happened, Chris? Couldn't handle the competition. Influential voice of the year. You were number one by far. Thirty nine point two percent. Jimmy Miller came in at eighteen point five percent. Joe Braverman thirteen point five. Then Travis Rattmeyer and Tim Parks. I thought Tim would have been higher, but. Maybe I'm just biased because we've had him on the pod and stuff like that. Um, yeah, he made he finally made a name for himself when he came on our pod. <laughs> yeah. The finance bro. Yeah, the, this is the hedge. The, that title was an instant classic. Hedge, hedge fund manager. Like pulling the like strings pulling behind the strings professional pickleball. Yeah. Pl- all time. Yeah. That was an all timer for sure. He, I bet like he definitely got made fun of for that, but also <laughs> sneaky was like that's awesome. Um, okay, so Selkirk, Rising Town. I just thought this was interesting. Um, so Zhao Mei, who will be on next week, uh, won by a decent margin at 34.6%, followed by Gabe Tardio, Judith Castillo, Tina Pisnik. So that's then, an interesting one to me. What? Like, because I feel like Gabe Tardio has been in that conversation. I remember I wrote a Dink article like two right. years ago of like who's going to break out in 2021. Yeah. It was like Gabriel Tardio. Mm-hmm. It's like it's it's strange that he's still in that, that sort of category. Like right. the other people have done it. Like Hayden's done it. Hayden's yeah. sort of broken through. I mean, you got to give some love to Rachel Rohrbacher on here. I think she's got to be up there. Sorry, John, I'll say it to your face next week. But like, she's made more of a name for herself, I think, than nah, maybe not necessarily. I think they're probably pretty close. Her and Jaume. Yeah. Tina, Judith. Yeah, they're both playing very well. well Deserve to be on that list. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Unbelievable people, recount. The people have spoken. Uh, and then, of course, congratulations to Altoff. I know his kids were um, you know, very focused on what this result would be. They really wanted their dad to win. And uh, he won 28%, followed by Dane Gingrich, 24.9% for Senior Men's Player of the Year. Congrats, Altoff. Front of the pod. Attaboy. Um, we'll publish the rest of the results so you can see them out there. Uh, I think by the end of this week, they'll be up on the, the dinkpickleball.com. Um, that's fun. I, I like that. We should have debated some of these a little bit more on the pod. I feel like we got busy and didn't, did we ever end up going through our, 
our votes on those for some of them for a couple of them a few different categories yeah i like that i like it a lot um right like best on air personality i was like matt manassi should be on there and he texted me like i got snubbed and i'm like yeah and then i sent him the clip for me being like he got snubbed on his pod and i was like (laughs) i agree (laughs) yeah if only you knew somebody at the dink that could like do something (laughs) about that um Let's see. So we had a really cool event in Vegas for the Super Bowl. Larry Fitzgerald, late entry. His game's coming along. But he also was with Patrick Kaka, Mm -hmm. who is a pretty solid pro. I think he does the Arizona Pickleball League, does some Mm -hmm. AVPs, some PPAs. Uh, And they defeated Casey Patterson and Tyler Wagner in the finals. So, yeah, it's a really cool uh, roster of people. So we had Larry Fitzgerald, Marcellus Wiley, Golden Tate, Cliff Avril. Jenna Bandy, this rapper J.O., who eh, didn't seem like he ever picked up a pickleball paddle before, and he ended up on championship court on the stream. Uh, so that was good. Kelly Dodd, Casey Patterson was out there, of course. Logan Lyle, Are You Kidding TV, Joseph Benavidez of UFC, and uh, a bunch of other cool people. So you had Pesa out there, Connor Garnett, Matt Manassi, Patrick Kaka, and uh, yeah, it was just a... Cool event. We'll try and do something like that next year for for the Super Bowl. Did you did you check some of that out? Who which which of these celebrities would you say had the best game? Like was was Larry the best celeb out there, or was he carried by Patrick? I mean, because like yeah. I hear Golden, my guy over at uh, he, he plays with the Pro XR now. I hear he's playing pretty well. Golden's got game. Cliff plays a ton. I mean, he's been training. Cliff Avril's been training with Tyson McGuffin. Um Casey's obviously very strong. I mean, we almost considered him like a pro because uh, he's like a five zero ish player. And so Jo was the worst. Like, yeah, well, who's the who's the second worst? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not saying Jo was the worst. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, no, you didn't say that he was the worst, but you said it looked like it was the first time he ever picked up a paddle. So that that's correct. like some arguably, yeah, potentially a worse statement. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, then everybody went to Hakkasan VIP to see Taiga which is just really funny to me. The idea of a much like pickleball people at a Taiga concert. Um, but yeah. Okay. All right. We've got uh, some merger updates. So have you been hearing anything before I run through some general updates? What's the latest that you've heard? No, I don't, not much. I'm going to be excited to hear the updates. I'm going to be, I'll react to it live. Well, it sounds like it's still kind of like the same issues festering. Um, but, the, I guess, most concerning thing for the MLP side is a lot of the players are starting to get weary and thinking of walking altogether, uh, looking at what other options they have. They're wondering, like, okay, so is this new co in violation of the new contracts, considering I have not been paid yet? And is there a way out of those contracts, right? I'm not saying that people are actively trying to get out, but I think they're starting to ask, could I get out if I wanted to? Because this situation does not seem to be progressing and I need to start getting paid one way or, or another. So I think one of the biggest concerns is that players are just going to start walking. And equally concerning is a handful of the top players have, quote, understandings with the PPA that if things don't work out, they'll have a home at the PPA, right? Um, so just uncertainty around all that. Um, I think Jilly B on her podcast said something interesting. Dundon essentially wants to start his own rating system. And as we know, the duper portion of this deal, there is duper equity involved in this deal, um, would directly conflict with that, right? Mm -hmm. But that brings up the larger idea that I think is interesting and something I've been watching, which is Pickleball Inc. essentially wants to own Pickleball, right? Pickleball Inc. is Pickleball Central, the PPA, and then pickleballtournaments.com slash pickleball brackets so they want to own the software the amateur tournaments the pro circuit the e-com right they've got the biggest retailer in pickleball central they want to according to jilly b release their own rating system they've got pickleball.com now doing a bunch of media it's like there's nowhere they aren't and and then they did the deal with the pickler which is infrastructure facilities uh and it sounds like they just want to own pickleball from all angles yeah it's a pickleball conglomerate basically if that's a 
possibility. <laughs> I mean, it kind of makes sense if you have some some money and you really believe in the the future of the sport. Like you might as well have your your fingers in a little bit of of everything, if, as long as you can do them all well, right? Like, you know, as long as you can execute on all those different things. So, um, that's just what pickleball needed. Another rating system, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have any thoughts there other than just kind of makes sense. If you're like looking, so let's just let's say you're talking to a sponsor, right? And you're saying I'm the number x pickleball player in the world in singles and x and doubles like what pickleball rating in your mind is the most reliable and accurate from a maybe not rating rankings standpoint mm. well first i'm if i'm talking to a sponsor i'm going to introduce myself as the most influential voice <laughs> yeah. of 2023 host of the number one uh host of the number one podcast number three fan favorite but um I would say, like, honestly, rankings right now are, I think, are somewhat important, although flawed, uh, very flawed, because they are, uh, certain players have played more tournaments, like, there's, the rankings are slightly flawed, but in theory, good, I think that's what you probably, that's what you want at the end of the day, is, is rankings, um, if you're gonna go, if you're gonna say your your rating, like I mean, it's I think Duper is still the yeah. absolutely the the best. Like mm -hmm. it's it's far better than, to my knowledge, UTR. Um, I guess I shouldn't necessarily say that. I don't know. I don't know it maybe enough to make that direct comparison. Um, but like I think that Duper is has its flaws, but is generally accurate as long as you have enough data in the system mm -hmm. there are some there are some outliers in some cases where like yeah that person's probably like not what they're rated in duper but like that for the vast majority of people pretty accurate yeah so i mean if that's the question i would say duper yeah but like there's no there's no universal ranking that people actually consider the most accurate record of like who are the top players in the world, right? Because you've got the PPA rankings, you've got the ABP rankings, you've got the rating systems. But I think the there's one ranking system out there, and it's so outdated. Like some yeah, the Pickleball like, Global. Yeah. One. Yeah, that was that was have, the first ranking system actually. Yeah. So that was the first. And it one. used to be accurate because I, I used to look at that and mm -hmm. PickleballTournaments.com used to be accurate, but I don't think they even updated anymore. Because you used to be able to get points from either APP or PPA. Yeah. Now PPA is only going to count your PPA points. And from what I understand, it's like been something like 18 months of tournaments, not necessarily calendar year. Mm -hmm. So like there's some some weird stuff with those rankings. But I think eventually it'll probably just be, you know, the, the PPA rankings. Yeah. But that's not going to take into account the people that are playing APP. Right. So, so somebody like Andre Deascu would just get... No respect. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, okay, so last thing on that topic is it, it still does sound like, though, that it's not the PPA that's holding this up. It's a large majority of the issue is MLP owner infighting and uh, fractured beliefs as far as could the MLP be viable as a standalone moving forward or... Does this deal need to go through for MLP to even survive? And the owners seem to be pretty split on that. And so MLP side seems to be the one that's really holding up the uh, the deal at this point. But other than that, no real updates. But March 1st, I think, is the new deadline they're trying to work toward. I don't know. <laughs> we know well, yeah. deadlines don't exactly mean anything. We'll um, find out. But, okay, so... After Desert Ridge, some interesting um, vocalizations by players about certain aspects of the game. So Tyson McGuffin had tweeted out his thoughts on a number of different things and then later deleted those tweets. Untweeted. Um, or untweeted. Unexed them. Unexed them. He X'd them. And uh, so he had one that said, one, serve rule needs to go. Two, Vulcan ball needs to go. Three, progression draw needs to stay. And then he tagged the PPA Tour. He followed it up with, my body was so th trashed 
After 10 individual games of singles, I was 60 to 70% at most during mixed day. Not fair to fans, my mixed partner, or myself, that players are all beat up and suffering. No way this 34-year-old dad can handle days like that. Regression draws is the answer. Um, and then Christian Alshon made a video, which to me, on the surface, was him criticizing the new ball, but in a way where he wouldn't get penalized for it. So he said... There was some plausible deniability. <laughs> yeah, there, right. Yeah. He sort of like did some head scratches and some pauses and um, essentially said, I'm going to try and be unbiased on whether I like or dislike it, uh, um, referring to the Vulcan ball. All I'll say is twice they gave me a brand new ball in the warm-up. It was wobbly and I had to change it out. So he got the ball and it was already wobbly, which is interesting. Uh, and then at the start of the second game, it was wobbly and we had to change it out. So that's a problem. But once you get away from the fact that the ball is wobbly at the start, if it is, 50-50 chance, I think. It's a good ball. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. So. Yeah, they're, I mean, if a ball stays round and doesn't break, it's a pretty decent ball. But those are a couple big, big ifs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't think, you know, look. I think the Vulcan ball is bad. Uh, just just in just because it's it's not round but like you know here's the thing we'll adjust they'll adjust right i'm sure this is not the final iteration of the of the ball mm -hmm. um and like they're gonna take into account this this feedback i'm sure they're working on some of this stuff and also like look you know we can complain but from what we understand he, huge deal with the with the ppa like that's you know do you do you want a a fraction of your of your pay or do you want more of these like type of sponsorships right this is this is money going directly from almost vulcan to pro level players pockets mm -hmm. eight eight million buck deal is what we heard no what I think was it, was it? Like two uh, and a half million. two and a half sure whatever it is like millions of dollars that's that's money much needed so like yeah yeah, I think they'll make improvements. I think they're, I'm sure they're taking into account some of the feedback. It's not a great ball at the moment, but like when it is round, it's it plays pretty well until it goes a little too soft or out of round. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, my only other point on that was it's just interesting to me. So we talked about this. Pat Smith was suspended for Desert Ridge because at the Masters, a PPA tour canceled the bronze medal matches and uh, sort of said there were injuries uh, and withdrawals that caused the cancellation. And then Pat Smith tweeted, or I think it was a Facebook post, just an update, all caps, no one withdrew. Um, and sort of said, I mean, he just kind of indicated that PPA Tour was not being truthful. He's suspended for an entire tournament. Meanwhile, you've got, you know, Tyson and Alshon criticizing the ball. If you read the comments, because we posted those tweets on Instagram, there's a bunch of pros in there like agreeing with them, right? So to what degree can you be outspoken and to what degree can you not? And I, I, I don't know. It just... It's... I don't know either, but I'm sure as hell going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but anyway, so... About yeah, I mean, it's that. not a direct criticism. I mean, that's that's sort of like a gray area. You're sort of you're somewhat criticizing a, a sponsor, but you're not criticizing the, you know, PPA uh, itself. PPA, right? Yeah. And yeah, so slightly slightly different, um, same sort of idea. But uh, yeah, I do feel for I do feel for Pat. Mm -hmm. So I think he's his. He'll never talk about it again. He just wants to move on from it. So we'll talk about it. <laughs> Hashtag free Pat. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it alive. Free Pat. Perfect. Uh, it's also hilarious to me that you're wearing a hat with my signature on it. Because that, <laughs> that was like sarcastic signature. I'm never taking it off. <laughs> this is uh, a sarcastic wearing of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, bring in Tom. Let's do it. All right. Uh, let's go grab him. But do you think you could beat Maddie Pickles in a 
No, that boy plays how many times a day? I mean, he's playing for like four hours a day. Yeah, but you've seen, <laughs> him, you've seen him play, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's also he's also one of the best people in the world. He's one of the nicest people alive. So Absolutely, you know. which is why we're going to rip him. We're starting, <laughs> to, but just so you know, that's how we're going to open this, I think. <laughs> we got we to gotta shout out Mac, Matty Pickles one way or another. Love that, man. <laughs> Uh, cool. All right. Well, do we do like a, an intro while I was gone or are we? No, we should probably redo it. I don't know. Or we can. We'll start we'll with s- Matt we'll Pickles goes, and then but... we'll, we'll roll from there. But we've got uh, Tom Webb here, CMO of the APP Tour. Uh, you came from Major League Pickleball, actually, but you have quite an interesting track record with pretty big organizations in the world of sports, just to name a few. Manchester United, small little football club out in uh, out in England. Uh, Red Bull, you did some stuff with F1. I believe you did some work with Austin FC as well, right? Yes. Uh, the U.S. Olympic ski team. Then you were at Major League Pickleball, and now you're at the APP. Yeah. Did I nail? Did I nail that? Yeah, pretty much. There's a couple of others. Uh, Polo, Ralph Lauren. I uh, worked for them back in the day when they were, them. got into tennis. Uh, did some work for Emirates Airline when they were getting into kind of small sponsorship deals, mm-hmm. naming rights and that kind of thing. But yeah, that's that pretty much brings us up to speed. So how did you find Pickleball? Major League Pickleball was the entry point, but how'd that come to be? Pickleball found me, and I'm obviously extremely pleased that it did. Um, been working for Austin FC here in this amazing city of Austin. Uh, my wife and I had two small children came into our world. And at which point I thought, do I really want to be doing a full MLS season of travel and home games and away games? And all of the time I'd be away from from home. And I was lucky enough to get offered another job in the sports betting space. So kind of moved out of that, um, out of Austin FC into something that gave me a little bit more time at home. And then somebody called me and said, um, what do you know about pickleball? And I said, not Absolutely very nothing. much, no. Uh, and they said, do you know Steve Kuhn? And I said, don't know him, Don't never heard of the guy. Uh, and an introduction was made and a couple of meetings happened and I helped Steve and his team get MLP off the ground mm-hmm. back in 21. So that was my yeah, first foray into pickleball. Got it. And did you do anything? Were you working between Major League Pickleball and APP or was it right from MLP to APP? No, I got hired by um, a company. This is a very specific sector um, who work in geolocation. So a company based out of Dubai um, who are very active now in the sports betting space where geolocation is an important part of how you regulate betting. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, they offered me a job uh, with some decent benefits that made me uh, have a conversation uh, with the MLP folks about where I wanted to go. Um, so I was with them for a while and then APP came knocking and um, uh, the opportunity came up and uh, I really wanted to get back into this sport. Um, I'm often asked why, particularly by friends of mine back in England who don't really yet still understand the kind of scale of pickleball, mm-hmm. why I'm involved in this sport. Um, and, and one of the things I tell them is, uh, you know, how often in anyone's career are you going to have the opportunity to be part of something that is um, this big, this quickly, and be able to help in some small way shape its its identity and hopefully shape its future. So, uh, yeah, the, the opportunity to go and join the APP team was too good to pass up, and I've loved every second of it since I've been there. Got it. Okay. And when did that, uh, when did that start? When did you start officially with uh, with APP? So I joined them in December 2022. Um, had a few um, journeys up to Chicago to go and meet the team um, in their offices up there. Uh, and then we kicked off the season, uh, the 23 season in January. So straight into it then. Um, uh, as I say, I mean, a great opportunity, partly because the APP people are really just good people. Um, at, at its heart, there's a crew there who believe very firmly in in integrity and uh, good morals and good ethics. And they want to do the right thing by the sport and by the people who play the sport. So I was kind of attracted to that ethos to begin with. One of the things I asked them when um, I started the job was, I, I want to bring the standards that I'm used to from the types of sport like Formula One, like Major League Soccer, like the Olympics. I want to bring those standards to Pickleball. Um, Because I think it's important that we give players of your stature, uh, the pros out there, but also amateurs and rec players. I think it's it's right that we give them 
the same sort of standards that you would expect of an elite Olympian or a, you know, a, a, an internationally known Formula One driver. And the OPP team said, we'll give you what you want, not without um, any kind of budget restrictions. There are some sure, sure. obviously pretty tight controls on what we do, but um, I'm given pretty free reign with an amazing team uh, to be able to create good content, uh, to, to do good storytelling, to engage people at the right time. And that's, um, you know, that's a real blessing to be able to do that. Cool. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, before we got on air, we were talking about like, I've known Ken for forever. We were talking about how I was playing rec play with Ken up, up in the uh, in the North Chicago suburbs before APP was even a, a thing. And like, we've always had a had a solid relationship. And yeah, dude's just a, he's a good guy. He is a good guy. He, um, you know, he started the first ever pro pickleball tour back in 2019. The APP, you know, w was the original tour that very quickly obviously broadened out into a pro and amateur tour. And at its heart, what Ken's always wanted to do is provide entry points into the sport for players of all abilities, all levels. And he's always championed within our event planning and the way that we go through our operational decisions. He is very, very keen that we make sure that every player has a really good experience. Uh, you know, whether you are a first time amateur who's coming to a tournament uh, or whether you're a seasoned pro uh, or whether you're a champions and masters level player, who is coming into the sport, um, it, it's really important to us um, that, that everybody has a really positive experience. Uh, so there's some kind of basic things that we put in place with that, you know, referees for every match, you know, good space between courts. Sorry, is that on the amateur side too, referees yeah. for every match? Yeah, I don't know yeah. that. Yeah, so we, we're making sure that everybody's getting really well looked after. Um, and, and that's something that Ken's championed since day one. So yeah, he's good people and, and at his heart, he, he really has every player's best interests um, in, 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 in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. So we didn't cross paths a ton. We, we mentioned that we had, had met over in, uh, at the first MLP, but last year I wasn't playing in the, in the APP uh, tournaments. At the beginning of the year, it seemed like APP was certainly sort of pulling back. They stopped trying to compete with the with the contracts that were being put together from the MLP PPA side, but towards the end of last year, you guys said we're doing away with appearance fees. But if you take a look at the the prize money now, like if you have a buy and are winning a first round match, you're ending up with a thousand bucks in that event. So it does seem like it's sort of quickly, pretty quickly rebounded from that early 2023 sort of uh, pullback. Mm -hmm. What would you think, have say about that? I, it's a fascinating subject and it's really kind of at the heart of how we go about our business every day. Uh, you, you use the word compete and, and I think that's an important word for, for me to talk a little bit about because we don't believe we're in competition with anybody, mainly because we're so focused on what we're doing. Um, we made some decisions at the start of last year uh, to, to put ourselves on a really solid business footing. And we've got some very bright people who are helping us understand where the business is going to go short, medium and long term. Um, you know, we use a lot of data to help guide uh, our business decisions about where we want to diversify, where we want to put our attention, where we're putting resource and budget into. So start of last year, yeah, we made some decisions about prize money um, and about appearance fees uh, that, that partly enabled us to get through um, you know, what was a relatively tough time for the sport overall. Uh, we also at the time made a decision to reduce the amount of live streaming that we were doing. Um, and those decisions have paid dividends because, as you say, we're now in a position where we have enormous fields of people coming into the pro game in our tournaments. You know, we're running pre-qualifiers for hundreds of players uh, before we even get into the qualifiers to get into the main draw. Uh, we've doubled the prize money for eight of our tour events this year and tripled it for four more. You know, we've added a team competition with a $100,000 prize purse for each of those five stops that we'll do. Um, we have increased the amount of prize money that we're paying to players over 50 and over 60. You know, we just did a tournament specifically for them down at Pictona in Daytona Beach. Um, and this year we've been able to put ourselves in a position where we're now increasing live streaming back to three days. Uh, we're going to announce pretty shortly an additional linear broadcast partner into uh, our partnerships with CBS and ESPN, which is going to give us even more exposure on that linear platform. 
Um, and, and all of this is rooted in, frankly, just kind of good business about being sensible with where you put your resources. Um, and But really with a very strong focus on making sure, as I said earlier, that every player is having a good experience. So the pros who are playing in our tournaments um, are now getting access to, as you say, decent prize money. Um, and they're also getting access now to increased exposure through the marketing platforms and the broadcast platforms that we're creating. Um, so w we don't really see that as kind of competing with anybody. Um, if we spend our time worrying about what other entities are doing, we'd be losing focus on what we're doing with our business. Um, and that would detract from uh, our, our ability to do our job properly um, to really service the best interests of players of all ability. Cool. Okay. I'm going to give you one tip. Do like this motion when you're turning so you're still talking to the mic. See what I'm saying? I will. It's a little technique. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Took me a while to get to it. I still screw it up sometimes. All right. Thank you. Um, just so people can hear you. But uh, all right. You said a bunch of things that I actually I kind of want to drill down on. Sure. Um, the first is so you mentioned it was a tough time for pickleball. What what are you referring to? I, th I think when the player contract discussions and the whole situation started in 2023, I, I think the sport overall um, does not benefit from those sort of internal struggles. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, you know, pickleball is such a wildly successful sport. Uh, you know, our data, um, our research through YouGov tells us, you know, nearly 50 million adult Americans have picked up a pickleball paddle in the last 12 months. Uh, and the vast majority of those players, 97% of them from our research, can't name a single pro player. Mm -hmm. So it, it feels like there's kind of internal battles within the industry which focus people's attentions on something which should be positive but actually is negative. Um, and, and if it detracts from your ability to be able to create platforms for great players to be able to play then I think it's pulling away from the, the overall sports ability to be able to continue to grow um, and to be able to ultimately for the pro game to match the, the uh, growth rate of the recreational game. Th that stat about how many people in America know who pro players are puts the onus on me and people in my sort of position to continue to invest time, money and people into creating better storytelling around mm -hmm. players like Zane mm -hmm. uh, and around the pro players who really do set the standard for the sport. Uh, and I think every time that we are m moving away from the focus on that sort of piece of our job, I think it's, it's, it's holding the sport back. Sure. So what are some of those things that you are doing and you are focusing on to build the platform? Very good question. So um, I mentioned the increase in, in linear and in live streaming broadcast. Um, I, I think that's important, but it's also important to make sure that we're doing that, that at the right standard. So the APP's relationship with um, Intersport, the sports marketing agency up in Chicago, um, gives us access to... As a side question really quick, is Intersport the majority owner of APP? Yes, that's okay. right. Okay, yeah. got it. Um, so uh, the relationship we have with them gives us access to people particularly in the production side, who are involved with some of the biggest sports events in this country. They're, mm -hmm. they're working on things like Final Four. They're working for the PGA. Um, uh, they bring production um, and broadcast production standards to our organization that, um, f frankly, are kind of unmatched in the sports world in this country. So that's one piece of it. Um, from my side, um, it's about employing really good storytellers um, who we then unleash with pretty simple instructions uh, to be able to create good storytelling around pros and around our events, um, and, and to some extent around amateurs. That means having good videographers, it means having really good photographers, it means having social people who really know how to use social to mm -hmm. engage with the right audiences at the right time. It means having good storytellers, good writers who can write the right stories for us, so that we are covering every kind of base on the marketing, um, uh, it, within the kind of marketing palette, to ensure that we are applying, as I said, the kind of content standards that I'm used to from Formula One or from Major League Soccer to a sport like Pickable. Right. Okay. One thing is you mentioned that 3%. Let's call it the 3%, the junkies, right? The people like me who want to tune into the streams all the time. Mm. One of the issues, I think, with the APP, especially in a time when, you know, there's infighting with these other organizations and you sort of have this opportunity to potentially pull ahead in, in some ways. But those 3% were having a tough time watching pickleball because mm. it wasn't on YouTube anymore, right? 
I myself was struggling to watch APP and, you know, if you just kind of listen to the community, there were frustrations about that. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's going to change or, and why was the decision made to pull it off YouTube and go with these other platforms that might not be readily accessible to the most engaged core fan base, which is that 3%. So it's worth noting, um, uh, we, we have a partnership with ESPN, um, which means our, among our other broadcast partners, um, which means we're on ESPN Plus when we're on ESPN. When we're on CBS Sports Network, we are on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So we continue to, to have um, shows on that channel. Um, the, the, uh, the, the cost of doing live stream to the standards that we think is important that we meet um, is, is something that um, was a relatively tough decision for us to, to talk about cutting back um, on the amount of live streaming that we were doing. But we did a, um, a pretty deep dive into what the numbers were looking like in terms of audience versus what it was costing us to be able to live stream as w in the past, as was four days for every tournament. Uh, so we made that decision to cut back to, to two days. We've now increased that to three days, sometimes on YouTube, sometimes on those um, uh, on ESPN+. Plus. The majority of the broadcasts actually are on uh, on YouTube, um, uh, not only live, but also in replays. Um, but uh, I, I talk about production quality. Um, uh, there are There's a lot of pickleball out there that is shot on one camera. So one, we call it the high end zone camera um, behind the baseline, which is just looking down onto, onto the court and giving you that kind of you know, aerial view. Um, it, it's important when we're talking about building the right platforms to showcase elite pros in particular, that we're applying, frankly, higher standards of broadcast production to that, that product so that we are not getting people who are new to the sport coming into it and saying, it, it looks like a low quality broadcast. Right. Um, the audience numbers in real terms for the live stream have not grown particularly well, um, particularly when on you YouTube compare, on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, been and pretty stagnant. And the audience numbers for the, the linear products, we are um, uh, our research from Nielsen tells us across all of the entities who are on on linear platforms, our, our, our audience numbers are all pretty much the same. So you'll hear some pretty wild numbers out there from people about how many people are tuning into this event or that, that event. Um, uh, a, a lot of those numbers um, may be slightly massaged. We were we were talking about that. Last <laughs> Thomas episode. has been calling like, BS on the nationals yeah, well, numbers since yes. nationals. <laughs> well, all pretty much anybody who's put something on one of the major broadcast networks has come up with and said millions of people watch. It's like, mm, but did they? And I just feel like you know. I don't know enough to be able to drill down and figure out what exactly is massaged, but it doesn't seem right. It, it doesn't seem right. It, it isn't right. Um, uh, there, there, is a, there is a growing audience. There are people who are tuning in, particularly when uh, you're putting product out onto um, de really good platforms that have um, well-engaged audiences already. But the, 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 I think some of what you're hearing is a need for some people to um, perhaps suggest that the sport is growing at the pro level faster than it really is. Why, why is that a, necessi a necessity? It's because you need to be able to tell sponsors that there are more people coming to, to watch your product. Right. Um, as I say, the reality is that the audience figures um, are pretty much the same across all of us. Um, and it is one of the reasons why, um, uh, as part of our kind of growth plans, we are looking at diversification and adding business verticals into what we're doing um, so that we, while we continue to improve the product uh, on the APP tour and on our signature events um, and in next gen and in our international portfolio, uh, that we are also starting to grow into other areas of the pickleball world mm -hmm. because that is the way you grow a long-term sustainable business. Right. So we'll talk yeah, about a quick question. Yeah, go uh, ahead. You are the most qualified person that we've ever had on to answer this question. Why don't people seem to watch pickleball on streams and TV? And what does pickleball need to do to convert these 50 million people to actual consumers of the professional game? Uh, I'm, I'm flattered that you would call me qualified to answer that. I thought you were going to... You're more qualified you're than I am. I mean, you're you're, you're, you, this is your competition right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think there's, there's two answers for that. The one is if you take the traditional sports approach, um, which is um, 
uh, that you build audience, you attract sponsors, um, and you um, uh, and you sell tickets to your events, and you sell uh, merchandise, and you do licensing deals. Um, ultimately, as you grow audience, that's going to attract TV rights money, which then help, helps to kind of supercharge the growth of, of that sports entity. The problem with that model, one of the problems with that model, is you're competing in an incredibly tough space. You know, if you take your average American sports fan, they probably have an allegiance to an NFL team. They probably have an allegiance to a college football team. They may be an NBA fan. They may be an MLB fan. Now here in Austin, for example, you're an MLS fan if you're a sports fan. Uh, and you, you may now be a Formula One fan through Drive to Survive. You may have been kind of given access to that. Uh, there are a multiple, uh, there are a multitude of other sports um, that, that are competing for your eyeballs and your, for, for your attention. Uh, on top of that, you've got TV, you've got movies, you've got podcasts, you've got music, you've got games, you've got all of the forms of entertainment which are competing for the attention for that audience. So if you take the traditional sports model and you expect audience to come to it, you, I think, are going to be facing a very long uphill battle because you're not really doing anything to tell the, 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 the wider audience why this is such a compelling sport. The other way of doing it, I think, which is really interesting, um, is where you engage the pickleball audience themselves, millions of people, and you start to have a direct relationship with those individuals and you drip feed pro player content into those conversations with them. So That's that a very kind of... The, like working with them through Pickleball, developing the relationship because they bought a paddle through Pickleball Superstore. That's and one. then in the Pickleball Superstore newsletter saying like, hey, look, we also have professional stuff. That That's exactly... It. You, you, Thomas, you do it with the Dink newsletter. Uh, the Dink newsletter is a really good example of you have some pro stuff in there, you have some product stuff, you have some tips and tricks, you have all sorts of varied content. You're not just pushing pro content at your audience. I suspect if you did, your engagement rates would drop pretty quickly. Mm. Um, so there's kind of two, two approaches to it. One is like almost like top down, um, which is let's do a traditional sports model and we, the, the audience will come because we expect it to. The other is, I guess you could kind of call it grassroots up. Build relationship with the, the rec player, with the grassroots players, Give them access to pro content that makes them say, wow, that's that's a real step up from what I can do. And then you will build an audience who will come to the sport long term. I think the reality also should be faced that perhaps there is a ceiling, a natural ceiling to what the audience for pro pickleball could ever be. Um, I think uh, Olympic aspirations that the sport has will be a real accelerator of growth of the pro game. Uh, and I think that as the sport starts to develop more of a real Olympic identity and the elements that are required for that, for example, better regulation, you know, more governance structures, um, doping structures, all of the things that the IOC will demand. I think given Olympic status, I think you will see more people coming to it. But um, both of these are, frankly, long term approaches. Um, I, I think that the latter approach, the kind of grassroots up um, is one that is better designed for long-term success. Okay, perfect. Very interesting. Yeah, we have not had anybody who has been has had your background to be able to sort of explain that. We've we've you know had some of our theories. We get a little bit more technical on you know maybe it's camera angles or maybe we need to speed up the game or slow down the game or whatever. But in the end of the day, like that's not the ultimate approach that that matters. It's more of the like engage with the people, dangle the pro content in front of them, and if they want to consume some of it, it's there for them. You you've just explained uh, what people spend an awfully long time in the marketing world trying to 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 understand as the marketing funnel. You know that that as a as starts out very broad with awareness, it starts to narrow into education, and then it gets down to the to the kind of tip where it's about engagement with people. Look at any automotive manufacturers advertising and marketing programming, and that's the way that they operate. You know, that from years out of somebody buying a car, they're telling you, this is a brand that you like and we're kind of the, the people that you should be trusting. The point where you get down to come and buy a car is, is way down that funnel. Uh, and, and I think Pickleball has to apply exactly the same thinking just because it kind of exploded out of the pandemic, just because there was suddenly an interest from investors and from a whole range of other people in the pro end of the game, 
it doesn't mean that those returns are immediately going to be there. But again, it is why uh, an organization like ours at the APP, why we are taking a long-term approach to this and building a business um, that, uh, that has really strong foundations um, for long-term success. Got it. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Global Pickleball. I think we've talked a few times on this pod in the newsletter. We've written articles that the APP is quietly expanding into all these new markets across the world and different continents. What's the thinking there? What's the strategy? How do you see that progressing? I know you guys just had the India Open, for example, which looked to be insane. Yeah, I wasn't there, so I'm not sure I could um, categorize it as insane. But Ken Herman just came back from that um, and said he had a wonderful time. Uh, I think he ate the spiciest rice he'd ever tried, which came as quite a surprise to him. Oh I think boy. anybody, yeah, don't uh, let him go to the Thailand <laughs> Open. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is a saying. This is perhaps a slightly negative way of describing um, kind of one of the facets of, of the strategy. There is a saying: when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. We have that written here because we like that quote. So is that a you quote? Did that? Did you come up with that quote? I'm, I, didn't, yes, I, I didn't come up with. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. I, well, no, that's I an did. that is an epic quote. <laughs> that's an epic quote. But it's also it's rather negative if you think about it in in, the, in those terms because it's not a particularly happy thing. But not for us, we're good. Like <laughs> maybe I mean, born and raised in in Milwaukee, and you're you're Michigan. Like we're cool with it. Okay. Like maybe maybe it's maybe it's like slightly derogatory to <laughs> someone from Lubbock, Texas, like yourself. <laughs> But born and raised, <laughs> go Aggies. No, that's not Aggies. I don't know what something like that. Something I don't know like either. Um, you just offended a millions every, of people. <laughs> every Texas A&M or Tech or whatever fan they are. That's okay. Hey, I'm British living in Austin. Every time I open my mouth, I, I think I offend people in this in this city. <laughs> um, so um, it, th th that quote is is an interesting one because um, it is absolutely true. Uh, if you think about the, the the growth of American entertainment culture, really starting after the Second World War, you know, with the kind of the birth of the teenager here in America, teenagers didn't really exist until it was kind of invented here in the 50s. And then suddenly, you know, rock and roll is starting to go around the world. Blues is starting to go around the world. Uh, and that's been the basis and, you know, of every kind of entertainment explosion worldwide ever since. Um, the, the same is true for Pickleball. Um, and the very facets of what makes pickleball such a, go a good sport, such a popular sport to play, uh, are as true here in America as, as they are anywhere in the world. So good example of that, uh, the English Open. Um, a couple of years ago, they had, I think, nearly 300 players playing. Last year, they had over 1,000 players playing. This year, I think they could have double that playing in the English Open this year. Um, and, and those are people at the top of the kind of pyramid of playing because those are like hardcore amateurs and pros, people who want to go and compete in a really serious tournament. Below that are thousands of people who are playing recreationally. Um, and the reason they're doing it is because they have fun. So again, our data tells us, we did some research with YouGov into why people play pickleball. 76% of all pickleball players tell us that the reason they do so is because they have fun playing the game. Um, it puts a smile on people's faces. And that's as true here in America as it is in India, in Australia, in the UK, in China, in Sweden, anywhere where it's growing. So we made a decision um, a, 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 quite a while ago that we wanted to support the international growth of pickleball um, because we think it's important that as, as stewards of the sport that we're bringing the same standards that we believe are important to our events to those tournaments that are starting to come up um, ar around the rest of the world. So when Ken, for example, goes over to India um, and, and goes with a bunch of pro players to go and kind of help them get their feet on the ground and go and compete in a tournament like that, he's also spending time with young players um, at that event, as he did in Australia, mentoring them, giving them some insight into what it takes to be a pro player. Um, the best players in the world um, are probably not, haven't even picked up a paddle yet. These are kids who are going to come through the system, who are going to start playing because they're given opportunities by local event organizers who are taking advice, guidance and help from us uh, to be able to stage tournaments that then set the right standard for how play should be done um, uh, in different countries around the world. So we're really proud of our, uh, of our international reach. Uh, we think it's going to open up pathways for players um, 
uh, to come back and compete over here um, more and more often and similarly create opportunities for players from here to go and compete internationally um, and earn money as the sport continues to grow um, in, in all those different markets. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the biggest markets outside of the US for, for pickleball? Well, I mean, China's the obvious one. Um, we announced uh, an a ESPN China distribution deal last year. So um, our events are broadcast to a potential audience of billions of people. Back to that subject that you, you mentioned earlier. And, and that broadcast deal, by the way, is to broadcast US events in China, not yes. to build a pro circuit in China and broadcast. No, it's, it's the first step in that awareness piece. Um, you have to put the product out there so that mm -hmm. people can tune into it and see it before I think you start then laying the foundations on the ground of, of, of how the sport grows. Um, China obviously has a very proud racket sports history, both in table tennis and now I I in tennis as well. So it feels like that's a kind of natural fit for it. Um, India, now the biggest population on the planet, um, has embraced the sport um, uh, like with a great passion. And as you say, the images and the video and the, the stills that we've seen from India and the reports that we've had from Ken, from Andre, uh, from Megan Ryler and the other players who are out there is that it was just a wild event. I mean, really good atmosphere. Yeah. Um, everything that you want from pickleball. Um, so I, I think China is the obvious one. I think um, India is, is, is another obvious one. Australia has embraced it really fast. Uh, and when Aussies get into sport, they, they really seriously get into sport as an Englishman. Uh, I hate saying that because uh, we have a deep-seated rivalry with the Australians for everything. Um, I think Europe's an interesting one because there is some kind of talk about how we, uh, how Pickleball competes with Paddle or yeah, Padel, Padel, depending on how you want to say it, mm -hmm. um, out, out in Europe. Um, I actually think the two are very complementary. I feel like, um, uh, it, 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 you know, the rise, the, the rising tide floats all boats. Um, I, I think... Um, the more people who are picking up a racket slash paddle slash bat, whatever it is of any description, to play a sport like this, the more they are then open to playing other sports. So, uh, you know, Padel has more structural needs when you're building a court. It's obviously harder, more expensive right. to build a Padel court than it is to build a pickleball court. So I think that we will continue to see pretty rapid growth in Europe as well. I, we think the rest of the world is maybe two years behind America. Um, and, and I think that's going to start catching up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So for the India Open, for example, it was powered by APP. Mm -hmm. Do you own and operate that or are you a supporter of it? Like, well, how does that relationship look? And then how does that look in these other markets as well? I know you have relationships with Pickleball England, I think Pickleball Sweden. I know there's something about Spain and Australia yeah. and obviously China now. But yeah. What, what does that structure look like? So um, we don't own or operate those events for them. We are partners for them. Um, uh, and if you think about the value that we can provide within the resource limits that we have, because ultimately um, it comes back to how much time and budget can we afford to put into something like this when we have a very core focus on the other bits of business that we're, we're, we're involved with. So um, it, 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 in a sense, there's a kind of consultancy role to it, but then we're also backing that up by sending people out there to go and help advise um, and help them grow and develop as quickly as possible. Um, so we have a very active role with all of those organizations. Um, and as our relationships with them grow over the coming years, uh, I think you'll see more and more of, a, a, of, of us having integrated input into what they're doing. Got it. Okay. And then so I assume you have kind of a short list of uh, additional countries that you want to go into next. What are some of those countries? Like, what are where are you seeing the most potential? Um, I, I, there is obviously there are European countries um, which are really now starting to fly. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, some some additions from perhaps some of the Western European nations that we currently don't have uh, announced partnerships with. Um, I think that South America is going to be a real hotbed as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are some very interesting discussions. Uh, in Central and South America, I think across the entire kind of Latino community, I think there's some some amazing opportunity there. Um, I, I also think Africa, um, c you cannot ignore the, the opportunity to grow sport uh, in Africa. Um, all too often, uh, Africa is, is ignored by too many sports um, at their peril because uh, there is so much growth potential um, in, in countries like that, in, in, in continents like that. 
And I think the, the, the great thing that Pickleball has going for it is, is how easy it is to set up and start playing. Um, uh, you, you know, we have um, really quite kind of small resource needs to get a court up and running. Uh, and that enables a very quick adoption of the sport in countries where they w want to get involved. Uh, and, and we are there to help guide them um, and help them uh, achieve their immediate goals um, as we help them grow. Got it. Okay, what do you think of the top 10 countries? Let's go top five. Top five countries for pickleball, not uh, U.S. not included. Hang on, for what currently right now in terms of playing figures? Yep. Uh, well, India has okay. to be in the top, did you say five or 10? Five. Go for five. Go and yeah. put them in in your perceived order of of amount of people playing. Oh, very good question. Um, so, well, England's probably top. Five. Do you want me to do the like like list them one to five? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> and you you're going to be held to this. For I got sure. it. Have We're you got the numbers you. in front of you? So I have one basis for the numbers. It's not the. There's no way to get a true read on it. But... So did you make these numbers up? <laughs> yeah, let's not get into the details, okay? Why don't you just answer the question? Okay. And we have 2.6 million people watching this. <laughs> okay. So... Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you did make the numbers up. Let's. let's okay. Um, uh, I would say top five are probably uh, Australia in fourth, um, England in third. I would say India in second. I would say China in first. And so fifth would be maybe Spain or Sweden. Okay. All right. So this is not, uh, I mean, you, you can't say this is the sole source of truth here, but I reached out to the duper guys just to see like what their user demographics look like. Um, and so it's one US, obviously, two Canada, three the UK, four Australia, five Mexico, six India. Uh, so 10 is China is 10th, but I think this is outdated because they said that China recently, uh, became fifth most. Now, obviously this is dependent on where Duper is allocating its resources. Um, but it's at least one, uh, basis for first yeah. insight. I think there's an also an important point here, which is, um, that's maybe a recognition of how many people have signed up for ratings. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, this is kind of what I was back to saying about about the recreational player. I think there are a lot of players out there who are just doing it to have fun and they're not maybe really particularly worried about a rating. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there who go to a place like a chicken and pickle or in the future will go to a venue like the Fort, um, our official HQ down in, in Fort Lauderdale, who are just gonna go and have some fun. Um, you know, these are gonna be casual players who wanna go and hang out with friends and family um, and maybe feel a bit bamboozled by, you know, ratings, software platforms. Sure. Um, th those platforms are incredibly important as well. Uh, that's why we have a partnership with UTR, um, because we think that the the technological might that they're going to bring and they're already bringing to Pickleball um, is going to be a, a, a real asset to the sport long term. Mm -hmm. But I think there are a lot of people out there who are just playing because they have a bit of fun with it uh, and maybe they're not that interested right now in kind of getting into the serious level where you're actually kind of recording ratings. Mm -hmm. So I just pulled up my last 28 days of YouTube views because this could be a good, and, and I think on your channel this could be a good thing too because we the, the viewing is somewhat downstream from from the participation, right? So just on my channel for what it's worth, 71% of my views over the last month came from the United States, mm. 9.3 from India, 6.2 from Canada. I feel like we forgot Canada. I feel like a lot of Canadians, even though there's only a couple of them, they really like it up there. UK is 1%, Australia 1%, followed by Singapore and Philippines at half a percent. So my views went US, India, Canada, UK, Australia, Singapore, Obviously, no uh, China. My videos are banned in China. Cool. Uh, I think those numbers directly correlate with the top five I gave. Seeing as I can't remember the top five that I gave in that order, I'm just going to say that. I think I that's think as valid the, as the top five that we've been looking at. Yeah, I think the only one that we didn't have in here was was Sweden. So for what it's worth, maybe yeah. they just don't care about learning about pickleball stuff. They just want to watch it. I don't know. They're very cool people. So they don't <laughs> like to be taught. Um, I, I should therefore um, give very sincere apologies to the good people of Canada for not thinking about Canadians. There we go. Um, Unbelievable. 
Yeah. I don't know if I were Canadian, I would hold a grudge against you. And oh, they, they already do. Is, is I, uh, I yeah. once managed to send at the uh, Montreal Formula One Grand Prix, I managed to send a press release out that talked about um, the country of Canada. Uh, so that went out to a database <laughs> of about 1,500 uh, sports journalists worldwide uh, and led to some immediate threats from Canadians saying, do yeah. you know how to spell our country's name? So... Um, I do love Montreal. You don't want to piss off those Canadians. They're an angry people. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like upsetting anybody. <laughs> don't mess with don't mess with Canadians. <laughs> hey, you say that in Texas. Don't mess with this place. <laughs> um, yeah, very interesting. I'm I'm super excited about the the growth of it internationally, and uh, it is exciting to see that the the American pro tours paying some. Uh, attention to to the to the stuff overseas i got a I got a fascinating message from my sister-in-law back in england um uh, actually last night she said uh her kid's school is investing money in some new sports facilities um and uh they are considering pickleball in her kid's school mm -hmm. so that is in a relatively small town in the southeast of england um where a year ago they would not have been having that conversation right. um and now it is very much part of the of the um the day-to-day -day vernacular over there so i think that's really good kind of anecdotal but really good evidence of of how fast it's growing sure all right switch gears a little bit here so um thinking about like I mean, we've touched on it a little bit but the potential merger of the ppa and mlp all these different contract disputes with pro players how have you guys been thinking about pro talent potentially signing them to exclusive or some other type of agreement how do you think about pro talent generally and aligning them with the app tour so uh, the first thing i want to say is um we, we don't really spend any time at all worrying about what's going on uh, you know in other parts of this industry mm -hmm. because um, we have too much going on in our own world and we want to make sure that we're getting that right across everything that we're doing. Um, we have a very, very strong belief in inclusivity over exclusivity. Um, we think it's important that players uh, of all levels have options of where to play, when to play, uh, and, and to provide them with the opportunity to earn without limitations on how and when they can earn. Uh, that, that is one of the reasons why a lot of our events have the word open on them, because they are open events. Um, and, and that philosophy is why we're seeing, we, we believe, such rapid growth in the participation numbers in our tournaments. Um, creating uh, like exclusive contracts for players is not something that we want to do. We want to be able to invest our uh, resources into creating bigger and better platforms for them. So you will see enhanced CC1 look and feel this year, uh, Championship Court 1 uh, around our, our main uh, uh, tour events. You will see a diversification of the types of, of events that we're running. So the signature events that I talked about, kind of specialist audience events. We did a collegiate teams championship in the first week of January. Uh, we've announced a women's only championship that we're going to be doing later this year. We just did the first tournament for players 50 and 60 plus for champions and masters with AARP. Uh, and we think that that is uh, the way to continue to support the growth of the game is creating really good opportunities for players of all levels to come in. At the pro level, uh, the reason, one of the reasons we think we're seeing so much uh, rapid increase in the number of pros who are trying to get into our tour events is because we've taken this sensible, smart approach uh, to, to continue to do within what we are able to do with within budget to be able to provide them with a really good experience at our tournaments. So as I said earlier, we're now seeing hundreds of players coming in for pre-qualifiers. Um, we're, we're actually having to find other venues outside of our main tour venues so that we can stage uh, qualifying event, pre-qualifying events before we even get into the qualifier. Uh, as we continue to increase prize purses, that will create more opportunities for more players to come and compete uh, or want to come and compete. Um, and as we continue to invest in marketing and in production, we're creating better opportunities to showcase their talents to a wider audience. So um, I, I think that is a really strong held belief that we have, um, that, that we should be giving opportunities and options for players uh, to play where they want and when they want. 
and to continue to increase in uh, in in the prize money that they're able to win uh, at our tournaments. Yeah, I mean, like if you're a decent enough pro player, you can you can win a a round or two in APP and make some very good very good money. Like that's not the case everywhere. You, sometimes you can't get into the other tournaments. Like, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, for me, I'd, if I was an up-and-coming player, like, it would certainly be enticing, right? Like, you know, I can understand the allure of wanting to play a, a PPA tournament where you win a couple rounds, you get to play against Ben and Colin. But, like, I can also understand the allure of, of winning a couple of rounds and getting some very nice prize money as a result of it. And, you know, having, you know, maybe a... Uh, more potential for sort of growth and and brand recognition right where if you come through the ranks at the the app you can be promoted as one of the the top players on app whereas you know that's likely more difficult to do in a quick fashion at, a, at the ppa right because they have they do have their players that they have invested in they're going to continue to invest in and are really really good right like it's going to be hard to dethrone somebody like like Ben, if you're a, a newcomer, um, so I I certainly understand the uh, the rationale behind wanting to play if you're one of those up and coming players. Yeah, we we're also um, I I think it, 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 our platform creates unpredictability, which I think is is important part of sport. Mm -hmm. I think people like tuning into sport and and having um, a, a, an opportunity to watch real competition where they don't know who the winner is going to be. So I think that's a, that's a good opportunity for players to come into our tournaments uh, and find themselves playing different people um, and, and having an opportunity to go and win. Um, I also think that the sport is, is evolving um, at, at such a rapid pace. And I, I would never profess to be um, technically skilled enough or have the kind of tactical insights to be able to dissect uh, the way pro matches take place. Um, like you would, Zane, or Thomas, you would, um, or, you. or the Thank kind you. of commentators. He paid me to say that, um, <laughs> or the commentators that you know we have working on our production. But um, I think one of the things that I found fascinating is players who come into our tournaments who we didn't know, who do well in our tournaments and then go and play in other tournaments and do equally well in those tournaments too, which kind of tells me that the, the level of competition is actually really quite high, but also. Um, it is open to new talent coming through um, and establishing themselves very quickly. So um, I, I think that there are, as I said earlier, there are um, a, a whole, there's a whole new generation of talent coming through who we don't even know who those players are yet. Some of them haven't even picked up a paddle yet, but there, are, uh, uh, there is a generation of players coming through now, some of them playing in our next gen tournaments, for example, who um, are pure pickable. You know, they've never played tennis. Uh, they've grown up with this game. Um, they've been given the opportunity to earn some money, gain some recognition um, in, in, uh, within the APP. And that's a really important part of, of, of our long-term philosophy is giving opportunities for players like that to continue to grow and develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got one in, in San Antonio this weekend, right? We do, we do, yeah. Chicken and pickle down in San Antonio. Um, it, it's a really good environment. It's a really good atmosphere down there. And, and back to what we were saying about how do we... Uh, 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 elevate those players I, I have a team of people from the marketing group who are down there who are going to shoot video shoot fo still photos who are going to do a bunch of storytelling around that event um, which is a pretty significant investment but it's really important that we're creating great content that helps tell that story uh, as well as it is um, for, for us at the main APP tour events mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually had uh, I've been playing the last couple of days with Elliot Ship, who's uh, from from Arkansas, down here to play at, at Next Gen. He's been playing over at the the lab with us, and he played baseball before this. He's 16. He's been playing pickleball for a couple of years, no tennis. And yeah, this the when Next Gen first came out, like maybe two years ago. You might not like this, but it was pretty trash. <laughs> <laughs> the kids were not that good two years ago, right? Like. But now it's like, dang, that kid is next gen. Like he's like hanging in there and winning games against me, Sincola, Stefan, obviously Carlos. He's probably better than Carlos. But like the level from next gen 
and I say some of these things mostly just to be inflammatory, but the level of, of, of next gen has increased so much over the 18 months, two years that it's been, that it's been there, right? Like it's pretty impressive to see. And it's pretty impressive to see how these junior players play differently from the people that have grown up with that tennis background. Yeah. It's, um, I think that 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 evolution and the growth in in that program um, is largely down to to Ken Herman's um, dedication to it. Um, I, I will say, watch this space because we have some more news coming pretty soon about how that program is going to expand um, and how quickly we're going to start growing that, and in the collegiate space as well. But I think one of the things um, you, you may have seen this: um, we took that next gen team. Up to the uh, up to Park City, Utah, to the U.S. Olympic Ski and Snowboard Training Facility up there, and spent some time with them, putting them through a full training program within an Olympic um, facility um, up in the up in altitude in, in Utah. That's the sort of thing that we have to do to continue to increase the capabilities of these players, and to continue to um, elevate their status. Um, I, I think it. it, it it's necessary for us to invest in that sort of program because that's what's going to help develop them as athletes. That's what's improving their game. So um, again, that's a kind of um, you know that's a sign of where we're putting resource, effort, and energy to continue to grow the game at multiple levels. Love it. Yeah, next gen is exciting. You do to get to see a ton of new names and names that you're gonna see for years to come. Yeah. What's the outlook on college pickleball? Uh, hugely exciting for us. So the collegiate championships that we did up in Westfield, Indiana, um, was uh, incredibly well received. Um, we uh, were inundated with requests from teams who wanted to take part. Uh, we had a really good strength, strong field uh, when we uh, staged the tournament. And obviously putting that on CBS um, uh, for the final product of that out on linear broadcast, uh, again, I think is an important part of kind of showing um, uh, our, um, our our strong focus on that piece of the game. So we're going to be announcing some um, expansion of the collegiate program through the course of this year. Um, uh, there is obvious interest from the college space now that there is a, a you know rapid growth in things like scholarships being offered, mm-hmm. things like facilities available to to players um, at different schools around the country, uh, and, and um, it's an important part of of our long term plan. Do you work directly with any of these universities, colleges, or is this mostly like working with the club manager and figuring out how to get them all out to an event? It's a little bit of both. Um, uh, th- there is some of the former. So we are starting to now work directly with some schools uh, on, on how we can integrate yeah, I get, them. I guess the other part of my question is, are these schools starting to show interest and um, you know, kind of make the first move and kind of come to you guys. Yes, that is starting to happen. Yeah. Um, and I think when we um, take the wraps off the, the next big part of our collegiate program, I think that's going to accelerate that very quickly. What's the next big part of the collegiate program? Watch this space. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. Uh, are you sure you don't want to divulge anything? I uh, My life is not worth it. Uh, there's, <laughs> there'll be somebody watching this who will be very angry if I, <laughs> okay. if I divulge that right now. Um, so... I mean, depending, I, I'm not sure what you can and cannot say, but is the idea to sort of do these regional college tournaments and then get all the winners out to a national championship? You, you, one could surmise that. Yeah. Yes. Right. Shout out Shannon Dan, who will be watching this and probably asking me not to say anything else at this point. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So big plans there. I mean, I know Duper is growing the collegiate space. I'm seeing all sorts of interest. I mean, I think like our podcast out of all of our channels has the the youngest audience and has a big audience of these these collegiate players my little brother plays for the michigan club pickleball team and it's crazy to see like the the growth that's happening there and across all these different clubs so it's cool to see that pickleball seems to be shedding that reputation as like the geriatric sport and is you know starting to get its hooks into you know younger players i, I mean you think about somebody in college maybe i think about my uh you know how cool i am too much but like in college i probably would have been like <laughs> i'm not playing pickleball like that's a that's like you know that's a goofy thing i don't want to be looked at the kid playing pickleball but I, I i don't think it has that reputation anymore like i 
I think it's sort of um, turned from the quirky sport to sort of this like new up and coming exciting thing. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned uh, how much uh, investment we put into data. Um, and uh, last year, we did some more research to understand, you know, who's playing, as I said earlier, why they're playing, when and where. Uh, the average age of a pickleball player per our research is now 34.8. Um, and the fastest growth is, is in that 18 to 25-year-old category. Um, it, it, it feels to me like we, we crossed the tipping point of pickleball being a kind of cultural phenomenon into being uh, an almost cultural norm some point through last year. Mm-hmm. I remember back in 2021, when uh, we, we were involved with launching MLP, making phone calls to people in the media world um, about pickleball and kind of the first question was always, what is that? We're way past that point. Right. Obviously, everybody, everybody now in this country knows what the sport is. Then the challenge was, you know, it's not an old person sport. It is a sport for everybody. Um, and it's rooted in, in fun. It's rooted in people feeling good about themselves and about the people around them. And I think um, n- now that we're way past that point, um, you know, where, where people are asking kind of basic questions about the sport, it's not surprising that it's being picked up by people everywhere mm-hmm. for some really, really obvious reasons. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very good way of staying healthy. It's a very good way of um, meeting new people and hanging out with friends. Uh, the amount of kind of anecdotal reports we get from people who say, I used to go to the gym and run on a treadmill for, for 45 minutes. Now I go and play pickleball in my lunch break. It, you know, that, that is becoming the norm. So if that's as true for somebody who is, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, as it is for people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. So um, it, it's also the reason why when I'm asked, you know, is pickleball here to stay? I say absolutely, because it's got its foundation so deep into the kind of people's normal lives um, that, that, that that's why I think it's built for long term success. I like it. Cool. Zane, you got anything else? Um, yeah, this has been on my mind for, for this whole interview. What did Ken Herman serve iced tea at the Indian Open? <laughs> No, he did not serve iced tea at the Indian Open. And you know that for a fact? Um, I, d- I don't know that for a fact. Okay. Um, but I, I suspect there are... I suspect there are but I'm a PR guy at, at, at heart, so I have to be very careful about how I state facts. Um, I, it's an interesting point, though, because one of the things it talks about is the experience that people have within the APP. Yeah, you are a PR guy, a PR guy huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> going back to the kind of bigger <laughs> subject. Um, is, yeah, I'll do the classic. Um, that's a great question. Now, let me tell you what I want to tell you. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it does speak to the kind of, you know, the fun and, and the collegiate, not in the college sense, but the kind of, you know, the family sense of fun that people have at events when they're playing pickleball. Um, it was not surprising in the past to see Ken, you know, wanting to look after people if mm-hmm. they needed some hydration, some refreshment. Um, Ken is way too busy these days to be doing that, unfortunately. So, yeah, now we have other people who do that for him. He's got to stick to it for the memes. <laughs> Just for the memes. <laughs> I, I always loved it. I thought it was entertaining. Yeah. And it does speak to, you know, he's very hands on. Like he does he's shaking hands with with everybody and anybody over at these tournaments and whatnot. Yeah. So. I, you know what, I'm, I'm biased, obviously, because I work with Ken, and uh, I'm very proud to do so. But I, I think it's important that people understand just how important he is to the sport of pickleball. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, in 2019, he launched the APP. He was the first person to kind of put his money where his mouth is and, and get these tournaments up and running. Um, you, you know, you, you know, you've known him a lot longer than I have. You know how passionate he is, how dedicated he is. I don't know when he sees home. I genuinely, I mean, the guy is constantly on the move, whether he's down visiting, uh, you know, the folks in Fort Lauderdale at the fort and helping them get that that facility plan up and running, whether he's out at tournaments, whether he's scouting new venues, you know, whether he's just going to go and watch people play so that he can go and help them. Um, he, he is an absolute force of nature. Um, and we're very, very lucky to have him, um, not just within the APP, but within the sport overall. Mm-hmm. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I remember when I was running APP Academy, like I was going back and forth with Ken on, on certain things, and uh, I would get an email from that guy. At, it, it did not matter what time. I've got emails from him at 5 a.m. I got emails from him at 1 a.m. Like, he's always on the go. Like, he's he's pouring his heart and soul into it. That's he for is. sure, and I respect that. So, good. You need somebody like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else you want to bring up? Any You want to break any news? Um, they, they, I, I'll touch on something which I can't again go into huge detail about, but um, I think it's it's important that people keep an eye on um, how our business is growing. We started, and you introduced me as uh, from the APP tour, uh, and I think it's important that people uh, are aware of the fact that the the Association of Pickable Players. You know, started out life as the Association of Pickable Professionals, operating tour events, and now really the APP is the kind of umbrella under which the tour sits, under which Next Gen sits, under which event, uh, signature events sit, uh, under which the international events that we're involved with sit. But those are all kind of events. Um, we have a number of new initiatives that are going to see the light of day in the coming weeks and months. Uh, which are going to really reinforce what a lot of us have been working on alongside putting on these tour events. Um, it, you know, the, the APP is built for long-term success. Um, we, we're very lucky to have a very good group of investors uh, and people who support what we're doing. Um, we have, I, I think it's, it's not arrogant of me to say, we have the best reputation uh, of any event organizer um, in Pickleball among the majority of players out there. Just look at the, the way that people talk about our events on social media during and after tournaments. Um, and we are going to be uh, growing and diversifying um, while staying very true to the core focus of the business, which is making sure that players from elite pros at the heart of our tournaments right through to those thousands of amateurs who are competing in what we, or in the events that we put on We've, we've got some really exciting, interesting developments to come. Uh, you know, I'd love to, to be back here uh, you know, in a year's time when I can talk in detail about quite a lot of what we've got coming. I, I think it's going to make some people sit up and say, ah, oh, that's what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. you know, the, and, and I've noticed some of the kind of speculation that you've been involved with, for example, on Twitter, uh, X, whatever it is we call it now, um, uh, and on the pod, um, and uh, you, you know, in, in other quarters, we hear people kind of making assumptions sometimes about where we're going and what we're doing. Um, and, and we don't have time to respond to all of those or to try and kind of educate because we're just focused on, on building this business. But we've got so many amazing things to come. I kind of wish that I could fast forward a year. Um, I said that a year ago, but I, I kind of wish I could fast forward a year so that we could maybe be hosting you down at the fort um, in this amazing facility that that we we're, we're calling home down in home Fort of Lord. the uh, Zane and Thomas's Wild West shootout. <laughs> hey, you want to start that conversation? We'll start that very quickly. It's going to be. I mean, that is going to not be. really west, but we'll we'll, we'll still go for <laughs> Doesn't it. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Wild Wild East shootout. Um, yeah. So that, that's kind of it. Just uh, you know, I said watch this space earlier. We're, we're we're so excited about what's coming. Cool. All right. That's all I got. Zane, anything else? No, thanks for coming on. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, this has been this has been a fun conversation. It's not you're you're somewhat local here to Austin, so perfect. Yeah, the accent doesn't give that away. But <laughs> been here for ten years, so um, and I have two little Austinite children, so yeah, I consider myself an honorary Austinite. And what type of accent do they have? <laughs> uh, they watch too much Peppa Pig, so they both have um, one of them's four, one of them's three. They say "mummy" instead of. I'm not going to do the American accent. <laughs> um, uh, so they have this kind of weird hybrid English-American accents, which confuses all their friends at school. <laughs> Love it. Okay, nice. Got it. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Uh, in a year from now, bring you back on. You can talk about all the all the developments, but this was great. That's, uh, that's PicklePod. And as you guys know, we're sponsored by Viore. We wear it all the time. Number one brand. We're the biggest fans of it. You can get 20% off your first purchase at viori.com slash the dink, V-U-O-R-I.com slash the dink. 
Enjoy free shipping on any U.S. orders over $75 and free returns. Go to viore.com slash sedink and discover the versatility of Viore clothing. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, dollar has gone, yeah.